This hour, the podcast is exclusively sponsored by my good friends at Advantage Gold. Advantage Gold is a five-star rated gold company with one-of-a-kind customer service. And when it comes to gold and precious metals, Advantage Gold is the only company I'll work with. Call Advantage Gold today and make sure you let them know that Mark Levin sent you. And now, let's begin. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting them from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Mark Levin here, our number 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. Folks, I want you to bear with me. I want to demonstrate to you why I've been talking for months and why I'm explaining that this administration is an anti-American administration from sea to shining sea with open borders, with its war on people of faith, with its war on parents. It is utterly rogue and out of control, and it is filled with filthy, lying, left-wing scum. And others who will do anything they can on behalf of and for this administration. This hatred for Israel is a reflection of their hatred for America. Israel shares our values, our faiths, in the middle of a hellhole filled with terrorists who want to slaughter them and slaughter us. Now there was an accidental bombing that took place in Gaza. And apparently the Israelis accidentally hit um, a location where There are, quote-unquote, workers, I guess humanitarian workers. People who are trying to feed the Gazans. And immediately, the Israelis apologize, said it was an error. Unfortunately, war has these problems and so forth. So, here you have an ally, supposedly, the United States, who has seized on this. Seized on it. From the Secretary of State, to John Kirby today at his briefing to viciously, viciously attack the state of Israel. And I want to play some of this for you, but before I do, I want to read something to you to remind you about it. Less than two years ago, less than two years ago, CBS News A U.S. drone strike killed an aid worker in Afghanistan. Many of his family and colleagues still stranded there. It killed 10 civilians. You remember that, Mr. Producer? They sent a drone to get a terrorist, and instead they killed 10 civilians. Seven of them were children in Afghanistan. It was the last act of our military under Biden. A U.S. airstrike in the final days of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan intended for an ISIS-K terrorist instead killed the aid worker, Zamar Ahmadi, and members of his family. After initially calling it a righteous strike and claiming no civilians were killed, the Pentagon admitted 
admitted its mistake and promised to resettle members of Ahmadi's family and employees of the aid organization he worked for. This was an aid organization trying to help the people who were starving, who were hungry, who had been abused by the Taliban. They order a drone strike that kills the person in charge of the aid organization and his family, seven of whom were children. Seven of whom were children. So we know from our own experience, certainly Blinken does in the Biden administration, that mistakes happen in war. It's a war zone. But now I want you to listen to John Kirby today. And what I find contemptible, there's not a single news organization in America, not one, that has pointed this out today. Not one. Here's John Kirby at the White House today. Cut three, go. We were outraged to learn of an IDF strike that killed a number of civilian humanitarian workers yesterday from the World Central Kitchen, which has been relentless in working to get food to those who are hungry in Gaza and, quite frankly, around the world. We send our deepest condolences to their families and loved ones. Uh, we've seen the comments from Prime Minister Netanyahu and from the Israeli Defense Forces uh, about their commitment to conduct an investigation. As we understand it, a preliminary investigation has been completed today and presented to the Army Chief of Staff, and we'll, we'll obviously look to see what they, what they discover in this preliminary one. But we expect a broader investigation to be conducted and to be done so in a swift and comprehensive manner. We hope that those findings will be made public and that there is appropriate accountability held. Mm-hmm. Hamas is slaughtering civilians as I speak, Palestinian civilians, all through the Middle East. Haiti's on fire. Millions and millions of people being slaughtered, raped, butchered. But the White House spokesman is focused on this. It's an opportunity to exploit, to undermine, and to attack the state of Israel. Obviously, this was a mistake. But Blinken even goes further. Blinken, who John McCain said is a very dangerous man, Blinken attacks Israel more for an accident than he, than he does Iran for its surrogates killing three American soldiers. I want you to listen to this from our Secretary of State. Cut one, go. But uh, it is, simply put, insufficient. Um, it is not enough to meet the needs of the children, the women, the men in Gaza who remain caught in a horrific crossfire of Hamas's making. So in our conversations with um, the Israeli government, including uh, just uh, last week when the defense minister was in Washington, and just yesterday when we were on a video conference uh, with um, Israeli counterparts, uh, we impressed again upon them the imperative of now surging and sustaining assistance and not only getting it into Gaza, but within Gaza, getting it to everyone who needs it, including in the north, where, as you know, the conditions are the most challenged. So he wants to turn the Israeli army into the Red Cross. While Hamas is still there with thousands of terrorists, they're getting weapons from Iran through Syria. He knows all this. They place no obligation on the enemy, our enemy, the terrorists, who've attacked the United States. And now the Israeli soldiers need to be delivering food and water and so forth and so on throughout Gaza. Not a word there. Not a word about Hamas's responsibility or their buddy Qatar, the buddy meaning Blinken's, who funds all this. No effort to stop any funding of Iran by the United States government. Funding of UNRWA. Oh, yes, yes, U.S. isn't funding it, but they're asking European countries to fund it. And so the Israelis are here and say, wait a minute. We've got to get this war over with. They only have so many troops, ladies and gentlemen. It's a very small army and a very small population. But it gets worse. He's not done. Notice he never holds a press conference and condemns Iran or North Korea or China and so forth. Notice. He doesn't hold a press conference about what Hezbollah is doing. 
No words to Hamas about slaughtering their own people. But it gets worse. Cut to go. The victims of yesterday's strike join a record number of humanitarian workers who've been killed in this particular conflict. These people are heroes. They run into the fire, not away from it. They show the best of what humanity has to offer when the going really gets tough. They have to be protected. We shouldn't have a situation where people who are simply trying to help their fellow human beings are themselves at grave risk. So his implication there is the Israelis are killing them. Listen to the ambiguity also. What about Hamas? And why would the Israelis want to kill humanitarian workers? So the United States can keep trashing them? That is Israel? Let me be clear. If Israel wanted to blow Gaza off the face of the earth, and it does not, and it will not, it could. Putin keeps threatening that that's what he would do to his enemies. Iran threatens when it gets the weapon, it will. North Korea threatens. Israel does not. Israel's the only country in the Middle East that has that capacity. And there have been experts on and on. This gentleman, Spencer, who will be on my show on Saturday, from West Point, an expert on military strategy, says the Israeli army, the IDF, has conducted itself like no other army on the face of the earth in the history of mankind. None. Go ahead. Uh, we've spoken directly to the Israeli government about this particular incident. We've urged a swift, a thorough, an impartial investigation to understand. They, they, don't, exact- they don't need you to tell them that. They've already started one. They already did. And so now this is drama. So now he's coming out, he's making these statements. People, more people are being slaughtered on our southern border tonight than were killed in this terrible accident, effectively. More people are being slaughtered in five minutes in most of the rest of the world than here. The Israelis said it was an accident. They take responsibility for it. Then he blames them for all these other horrors in Gaza when it comes to these, these workers and so forth. We know Hamas is a terrorist organization. We know Israel is not. And this is the sort of stuff that is spreading anti-Semitism in our own country. Jew hatred in our own country. By Blinken. By Kirby. And it's getting worse and worse and worse. And we, the people in this country, are going to pay the price for this. Now he has positioned this accident as Israelis not wanting to give food and aid to the Gazans, as too many humanitarian workers being killed, presumably he's implying by Israel, which is nonsense. No pressure on Egypt to open its border. None. None. Let's go on. And as we have throughout this conflict, we've impressed upon the Israelis the absolute imperative of doing more to protect innocent civilian lives, be they Palestinian children, women and men, or be they aid workers, uh, as well as to get more humanitarian assistance to more people more effectively. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. The man that handed Afghanistan over to the Taliban, Blinken. The man who was dealing with Iran, selling out our country, and Iran will have nukes that we pay for. This one incident, sad, terrible incident of seven uh, workers, aid workers being killed, is now front and center for the Biden administration, Blinken, and this loudmouth Kirby. It's as if Hamas has written the script. But not a single reporter 
tonight as I speak, or during the day, and I posted this, says to Mr. Blinken and Mr. Kirby, can I ask you a question? Less than two years ago, you guys ordered a drone strike on what you said was a terrorist. You celebrated it. You said it was a righteous strike, quote-unquote. Then it turns out that you hit the head of a major aid organization and killed his entire family, seven of whom are children. So can't you understand that in war... As horrible as these things happen, they're impossible to completely prevent. Given your record, Mr. Kirby, given Mr. Biden's record and Mr. Blinken's record and Mr. Austin's record. So tell me something, America. Why hasn't a single reporter asked the question? Why hasn't a single reporter answered the question? The U.S. government has resettled, has resettled 11 of the 144 individuals who were affected by the drone strike. 11 out of the 144 uh, as of August 2022. And the others are represented by the ACLU. They're representing Ahmadi's family members. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Our once mighty dollars under siege from runaway inflation. For those still working, your paychecks buy less while costs for gas, food, cars, utilities skyrocket thanks to inflation. That's why I'm urging all my listeners to register for the upcoming Gold and Silver Summit hosted by our friends at Advantage Gold. It's a fantastic seminar. They'll teach you how to take steps to help guard your wealth from inflation using asset diversification into physical precious metals. Gold and silver hold intrinsic value that should remain untouched by government manipulation. Folks, don't wait for the Fed's reckless policies to completely devalue the dollar and steal your life savings. Call now while free registration is open. I'm telling you, this is a fantastic seminar. Call 800 900 8000 right now. The Gold and Silver Summit could provide the vital insights we need to protect our families. 800 900 8000. Tell them Mark Levin sent you. Performance may vary. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Always consult your financial and tax professional. The other thing is to hear this guy blinking in his condescending, self aggrandizing way, lecture the Israelis about how they're fighting this war. I want to remind everybody of something. Biden and Blinken funded this war, and they're still funding this war, with tens of billions of dollars to Iran. Biden and Blinken are drenched in the blood of the people who have died since October 7th and before. Biden and Blinken haven't changed one whit in terms of funding the Iranian regime and its surrogates the terrorists, even after they murdered three American soldiers, which is never discussed. Biden and Blinken launched a drone in Afghanistan that killed a leading aid worker and nine members of his family, including seven children. And I don't remember the Israelis holding a press conference to condemn Biden, Blinken, or the United States. This is grotesque. Attention, fellow Americans, Mark Levin here with a warning and a solution. I feel like our country is being destroyed by out-of-control spending and debt thanks to Biden and the American Marxists. And your hard-earned savings and retirement could be at risk from their socialist schemes. That's why you should consider Advantage Gold the best of the best, a U.S.-based company that specializes in helping everyday Americans protect their wealth. They have a simple solution to help you even potentially grow your wealth despite the attacks from Washington. I urge you to register for their upcoming gold and silver summit it's fabulous a free online event where you'll learn tips to help safeguard your finances by diversifying into physical precious metals call 800-900-8000 800-900-8000 
800 900 8000 Call them right now to sign up securely for this pivotal summit. It is crucial. Tell them Mark Levin sent you for a special bonus. Call 800 900 8000 right now. Performance may vary. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. You should always consult your financial and tax professional. Mark Levin, the research arm of conservative media. Call in now, 877-381-3811. So now the attacks on Donald Trump, because he used the word bloodbath, the Democrat Party and the media have decided you can't use the word bloodbath because that proves you're Hitler. And so the dummy who speaks for the dummy at the White House was very upset that the word bloodbath was used by Donald Trump. So maybe the Democrats should just send us a list of words that we're not allowed to use, or who can and cannot. USA Today, former President Trump returned to the campaign trail Tuesday and again employed the violent imagery of a bloodbath, this time to describe crime and illegal border crossing. You know what's amazing? They attack him for the use of words when Biden has funded terrorism in a war in the Middle East. When Biden's policies have resulted in massive slavery on the southern border, sexual rape, abuse, molestation of women and children like we've never heard of before on the southern border, fentanyl coming into the country, killing over 100,000 American citizens, and by the way, people aren't sitting there taking fentanyl. I mean, it's often by accident. It's snuck in other medicines and so forth because the communist Chinese are behind it. And the Mexican warlords are doing their dirty work for them because the communist Chinese are paying them crap loads of money. And Biden does nothing. That's wrong. The border's wide open. There's never been a border like this, Trump said, while criticizing Biden during a prepared speech in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Standing behind a podium sign that read, Stop Biden's Border Bloodbath. What is wrong with that? David Jackson, who wrote this piece in USA Today, have you been to the border? Have you seen the bloodbath? In that case, he used it to allege American auto industry would suffer under current U.S. trade practices. So what? We're going to deliver justice for Ruby. Ruby Garcia, who was shot and killed last month by an illegal alien. Trump also talked about Georgia nursing student Lake and Riley on the campaign trail. She was killed earlier this year, and the man arrested in her death was also in the country illegally. Democrats, including Biden campaign aides, have accused Trump of trying to make political capital on personal tragedy. Isn't that amazing? So if you point out The consequences of Biden's policy, which is murder by illegal alien. You're exploiting the issue politically. If you point out that Donald Trump went to a wake for a police officer murdered in cold blood in New York, while the three stooge Democrat presidents and former president, rather former presidents and president, are raising $26 million at some gala at the Radio Music Center, music hall rather, You're exploiting the death of the police officer. See how it works? And all day today, the administration, all with their talking points, exploiting the tragic accident that occurred in Gaza and trashing the hell out of the state of Israel. Now, let me tell you a little something else that's going on that's not being reported here. Several hundreds of radical Israelis under Ehud Barak, no doubt. Ehud Barak is the failed disaster of a former prime minister. Apparently thugs, they paid thugs or thugs associated with them, tried to burst into the home of Prime Minister Netanyahu and his wife while they were there. You hear that, Mr. Producer? Security had to hustle to protect them. And it's all being celebrated in the Arab media. And you better believe that Blinken and Biden know about it, and they're smiling ear to ear, too. So they tried to physically break into the Netanyahu home a couple hours ago. A couple hours ago. And they almost succeeded. 
They almost succeeded. Robert Kennedy on CNN yesterday. Aaron Burnett, another phony journalist. Cut four, go. But do you really believe that when people talk about the threat to democracy that Trump poses, do you really think that that is is, is an equal yeah, evil I mean, to I, Biden? I, I mean, listen, now stop I, there. Now notice the question. you got to be kidding, right? The threat to democracy. Everyone knows it's Trump, not Biden. How can you say it's equal to Biden? This is why Aaron Burnett will never get beyond CNN. Nor should she. And when CNN folds, she'll fold too. Go ahead. The argument that President Biden is a much worse threat to democracy. And the reason for that is President Biden is the first candidate in history, the first president in history that has used the federal agencies to censor political speech. So to censor his opponent, I, you know, I can say that because I just won a case in the federal court of appeals and now before the Supreme Court. It shows that he started censoring not just me. 37 hours after he took the oath of office, he was censoring me. No president in the country has ever done that. The greatest threat in democracy is not somebody who questions election returns, but a president of the United States who used the power of his office to force the social media companies, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, to open a portal and give the access to that portal to the FBI, to the CIA, to the IRS. The CISA, the NIH, to censor his political critics. Dana Bash would have none of that, of course. Being a real journalist and everything, you know. She is a hack mouthpiece who burps up the usual left wing Democrat Party talking points. Listen to this. Cut five, go. Now, let's just be very clear. This is an important fact check. Joe Biden wasn't setting out to censor Kennedy's speech or his political critics. His administration was encouraging social media sites to monitor and take down false information about the COVID-19 pandemic. There's no evidence that Biden himself was involved. Ah, uh, OK. OK, there's no evidence Biden was involved and they weren't trying to silence Kennedy or of course, silence anybody. They were just trying to put the facts out because that's what the government does. They were just encouraging social... Hey, Dana Bash, what, did you read the two courts and their decisions about what Biden and his administration actually did, the district court and then the circuit court? You make it sound so harmless, Dana. Why are you on the side of the Hamas terrorists? Why are you on the side of the anti-free speech Biden administration? Why are you on the side of all the thugs? Because they're Democrats? Yes, he was out to censor Kennedy's speech and political speech. That's a fact. And we've had people who've written about it. You may want to bring them on your program. Taibbi and Schellenbacher, whatever that guy's name, and Barry Weiss and others who went through all that material. They're not on your program, are they, Dana? And Taibbi's made the point that virtually every federal department was in on this. And why don't you also tell uh, your audience, all seven people, Dana Bash, that Joe Biden has personally denied Secret Service protection to Robert Kennedy, whose father was murdered by a Palestinian terrorist. And he's on the side of Israel against Hamas, unlike CNN. And God forbid, doesn't he deserve protection, Mr. Producer? Is that not insane, America? And so Dana Bash is part of the censorship crowd. Dana Bash is part of the propaganda crowd, an IQ of about 14. She loves her job, and she knows where she has to stand and what she has to say to keep it on CNN. And she's going to do a fact check, you see. That's pretty funny. That's pretty funny. So she comes in over the top. It's an important fact check. Biden wasn't setting out to censor RFK Jr.'s speech or his political critics. What she's not saying is that when you censor the entire discussion, you certainly are censoring Robert Kennedy Jr. and others. I will tell you this. The Democrat Party would have done itself a huge favor if if instead of Biden, they were nominating Robert F. Kennedy Jr. I'm not a big fan of his. But he's not a detestable, lying piece of crap like Biden is. 
That he's not. He's earnest, even if I think he's wrong on a number of issues. He loves America. Biden clearly does not. He used to love the Confederacy and the Klan. Now he loves Hamas. And that's who the man is, and that's who his supporters are, or I should say his staff is, in the White House. So Dana Bash, I'm going to fact check you. Number one, Joe Biden was in fact trying to censor people. Why else would he set up that board at DHS? Oh, well, they got rid of it. Yeah, but they've kind of set it up in any event. Number two, yes, his departments and agencies were working with Twitter, Facebook, Google, and others to try and prevent political speech. Political speech. And that includes the laptop issue. Number three, when you say there's no evidence that Biden himself was involved, what kind of a stupid comment is that? Did you sit in in all the meetings? Is Biden going to say, yeah, I told them to do that? What kind of a stupid comment is that? Let me put it this way. Biden didn't want it to happen, and he has newspapers and briefers and, and uh, press people all around him. He could have stopped it, but he didn't. But he didn't. You're a disgrace, but you've always been a disgrace. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. My fellow Americans, we're living in very perilous economic times. Washington seems determined to bankrupt our nation with endless stimulus spending. As they devalue our dollar, hardworking Americans like you could lose everything. That's why I urge you strongly, register for the upcoming Gold and Silver Summit hosted by our friends at Advantage Gold. They'll teach you how to help guard your wealth using asset diversification into physical precious metals. Gold and silver can offer a defense against the dollar's devaluation, and the experts at Advantage Gold will explain how you can convert some of your savings into precious metals that can protect and potentially grow your wealth. With currency debasement from Washington and global uncertainty on the rise, gold and silver diversification can offer you some stability. Call 800-900-8000 right now to sign up. 800-900-8000 now. Tell them Mark Levin sent you. Performance may vary. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. You should always consult your financial and tax professional. And so the media are populated with these uh, individuals who, uh, who attack Trump and who support Biden. And the hosts don't really need these guests because they do it themselves. You saw that Erin Burnett or Burkett or whatever the hell her name is. What? You actually think Biden's as dangerous to democracy as Trump? It just shows you how completely mindless they are. Dana Bash is going to fact check Robert Kennedy. We all live through this. We all know what Biden did and his administration did. We all heard the testimony of Taibbi and some of the others who went through all the Twitter information. So Dana Bash just blows it off. And there's no evidence then that Biden himself was involved. Come on now, no evidence that Biden himself. Netanyahu, of course, he actually fires every bullet that's fired in his, you know, in the Gaza. But Biden, we have no evidence that he's involved in anything. But he's a genius, even though he comes off as a complete imbecile. Oh, okay. You want to hear something very funny, by the way, before we go to the break? I'll see if I can squeeze it in here. Cut 7 is pretty funny. It's our boy Joe Scarborough on the morning schmo today. Cut 7, go. What we saw last week was a poll that showed Biden making great strides and doing yes. it on the strength of younger voters coming home. Yes. What we're seeing now is Biden making yes. really good strides on the strength of independents coming home. Yes. And so Dan Pfeiffer, I think it was Dan Pfeiffer, saying the yes. important thing about the State of the Union address wasn't that it was going to give Biden a quick bump. Right. It's that it proved the Republican lie that he was some doddering old man, some doddering right. idiot. Right. And it was not a Republican lie. We're all seeing it. We all hear him. You know, like oyster eggs. Oyster eggs. He's a doddering old fool. He certainly is. Every now and then he comes up for air. Uh, there's no question about it. And what Joe Scarborough and Pfeiffer want you to believe is them, not your eyes, not your ears, not what you, you know to be true. And yet we have a report from a special counsel that has certified officially that Joe Biden is an imbecile. 
Hence, he wouldn't bring charges against him. So Joe Biden escapes prosecution for violations of the Espionage Act. As senator, as a private citizen, and as a vice president, as he was selling secrets to a publishing house for $8 million. Right, that's what he did. They don't know I have this. And, on the other hand, running for president, he's Albert Einstein. So when it comes to charging Biden, he's an imbecile, so, you know, we can't do anything. But when it comes to electing him president, he's actually Alfred Einstein. This is the line, Scarborough, Bash, the other reprobates, malcontents, and miscreants want you to believe. That the guy's brilliant, but he's not responsible for anything. Hey, there's no evidence Biden himself was involved, was there? Can you? Hold on, folks. Anyway, um, cut, uh, I think, let's go to cut, um, cut eight, please. Go. And this BS, oh, Joe Biden's a socialist. They love to say that. Joe Biden's a, so- oh, really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, is yeah. that why you get richer by the second? Is that why you have more <laughs> money than you know? You know, their problem tax season is, it, it really is. If, if yeah. they're investing in the stock market, it's not that he's a socialist and they've got to figure out how to hide money. It's that they're making too much money. Mm-hmm. And they got to figure out. Idiot. I mean, Joe, seriously? Do you realize in every respect you defend this guy? Well, Mark, you do with this. No, I don't. In every respect. You know, over at MSNBC, they don't care about ratings or anything. They're on a mission. NBC and Comcast, apparently, to destroy the country. They're propaganda operations. That's all they are. By BS, he's not a socialist. Sure he is. He hasn't had one free market idea in his life. He's spending the country into bankruptcy. Inflation is through the roof. Of course he is. Well, what? He's not a capitalist. He said, I'm a capitalist, but I'm a small d Democrat, but you don't need any buts. That's exactly what he is. Sometimes I wonder, Comcast, is the board of Comcast this radical? This anti American? Is it really this bad that it pays for these platforms for people like this? Apparently it is. And so many of these boards, these boards of directors, are completely detached from their audiences. They're completely detached from the American people. So Joe Biden is not a socialist. Joe Biden is actually brilliant. Joe Biden is not dangerous to to democracy. No, none of these things. And they go over and they ignore Joe Biden's background. Joe Biden's background. From the Confederacy to Marxism. Right back. This segment of the podcast is exclusively sponsored by Pure Talk. Pure Talk offers great coverage and can save your family money on your wireless bill every single month. Go to puretalk.com to find the plan that's right for you. Thank you again for listening, and thank you so much for this sponsorship, Pure Talk. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, America. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. Bill Malusian, who is really a fantastic reporter at Fox. I want you to listen to this. Uh, yes, this was put out this evening. He says, Border Patrol arrest of Chinese nationals who crossed the U.S. border illegally over recent years. Fiscal 2021. 342. Fiscal 2022, 1,987. Fiscal 2023, last year, 24,125, Mr. Producer. Fiscal year 2024, in the first quarter so far, 
22,233 Chinese nationals crossed into America. Now, you know damn well they didn't get here without the permission, if not the support of the communist Chinese government. That's a 6,300% plus increase since FY21, America. Why is Joe Biden doing this? Because he hates America. There's no other explanation. None. He hates America. And then this on Breitbart. Hundreds of thousands of migrants fly into Miami to score Joe Biden's parole benefits. Ready for this one? Hundreds of thousands of migrants have been authorized to fly into Miami, Florida, among dozens of other United States airports. As part of a parole pipeline that President Joe Biden's Department of Homeland Security created and implemented. That's enormous. Let's see here. Biden's DHS launched the parole pipeline known as Advanced Travel Authorization in October 2022. It has since permitted 386,000, boy, that's up from the last time we reported, 686,000 migrants to book their flights to the U.S. to secure, quote, humanitarian parole, unquote. The parole is particularly enticing for migrants because as opposed to crossing the southern border, it can include eligibility for work permits that can be renewed. Analysis of DHS data shows that Miami is the top airport where parole migrants are flying in at their own expense, followed by airports in Houston, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Atlanta, Boston, Baltimore, and Chicago. The person who's discovered this at CIS, Bensman, says whether those hundreds of thousands stay in those areas or fly on another on after their initial landing and release is not shown in the data. Many of the landing Cubans, Venezuelans, Haitians will obviously choose to stay in Florida. Where expatriate communities are already large, but some percentage of the newly legalized, quote-unquote, aspiring border crossers who land there and in Texas, New York, and California likely transfer to domestic flights to their final destinations across America. The Center for Immigration Studies unveiled that the nation's foreign-born population has surpassed 51 million. That's the highest in American history. Put another way, the foreign-born population is 15.5% of the total U.S. population. That is massive. And you know there's no assimilation going on. You can see it. We don't assimilate anymore. Teachers' unions don't want to assimilate. The Democrats don't want to assimilate. In fact, The cultures these people are supposedly fleeing are the cultures that are supposed to devour our culture. Because the American culture we know is bankrupt, it's white supremacist, and the usual claptrap. Through legal immigration as well as illegal immigration, Biden's policies have worked to explode the foreign-born populations to levels never seen before in the United States. Since President Biden took office in January 2021, the foreign-born population has grown by 6.4 million, larger than the individual populations of 33 states, says Stephen Camerata and Karen Ziegler of CIS. Growth in the foreign-born population is being driven primarily by immigration from Latin America, which has grown by 4.2 million since January 2021, with South and Central America up 1.7 and 1.4 million, respectively. Also, immigration from the India subcontinent is up 819,000. From the Middle East, up 654,000. Without a reduction in immigration, Camerata and Ziegler project that the foreign-born population will hit an unprecedented 60 million by the end of 2028. 60 million. 60 million. And, of course, a significant percentage. We don't even know who they are. Hey, what's this replacement theory stuff all you racists out there are promoting? Oh, replacement. Well, what are they doing with 60 million people? What's the purpose? To change the electorate, to change the country. And again, you just have to listen to the left. America's just too damn white and Christian and male. We need to fix that. Then you say, well, what's with the open borders? This replacement. Oh, you must be a racist with this. It's like DEI. DEI. 
when the Florida governor, our man DeSantis, says in our colleges, no more DEI and kills the slots, he's attacked as being a racist. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. But if somebody actually goes through the DEI process to get a position, you say, well, they went through DEI. Oh, you must be a racist. You're not allowed to say that. Well, which is it? That it is a program to be embraced, celebrated, and funded? Or that it has a stigma tied to it? Which is it? And stop telling us what we can and cannot say. Yes. But there's more, America. There's more. There's a lot more. I've been doing some research into these other things here, like all the great things that come across the border when you don't have a border. And it's totally out of control, you know. Measles now through the roof. Measles through the roof. Tuberculosis cases, the highest level in a decade. Bacterial meningitis is spreading in the United States, says the CDC. So meningitis, tuberculosis, and measles. I thought we defeated all that. And there will be more. Those of you who want to dust off a copy of Liberty and Tyranny, get that chapter on immigration. Where I predicted to you that among so many other things that are happening, that one of them would be an attack on our health system. Because diseases that we have defeated, largely, are going to return. Because people are coming into the country by enormous numbers, and many of whom are secreting themselves in our society and haven't obviously had certain vaccines or medicines. And so they're going to spread this. When I wrote that book so many years ago, among other things, people said, I don't know if I'd put that in there. I said, well, well, why? Of course I'm going to put it in there, because it's true. And it's happening. And even one of the news articles in which it was written, it says, now this isn't because of immigration, of course. It's because a thousand other things that don't even make any sense. Well, why wouldn't it be because of immigration, people coming from every corner of the earth? Why do they deny the truth, the facts? So a threat to democracy, according to CNN, 60 million new people in a period of about a decade, a little more than that, that's not a threat to democracy. The Democrat Party threatening teachers, that's not a threat to democracy. The Democrat Party Going after pro-lifers, that's not a threat to democracy. The Democrat Party trying to imprison Donald Trump, that's not a threat to democracy. We'll be right back. Mark Levin. Nowadays, 20 bucks barely gets you a burger and fries and maybe a quarter tank of gasoline. You know what it will get you, though? For just $20 a month, you can get unlimited talk, text, and plenty of 5G data from my cell phone company, Pure Talk. You'll get the same quality of service as AT&T, Verizon, or T-Mobile, but for half the cost. The average family saves almost $1,000 a year, all with no contracts and no activation fees. You can trade your phone or get great deals on the latest iPhones and Androids. Make the switch today and save an additional 50% off your first month. Choose a wireless company that shares our values, that supports our military and veterans, that creates American jobs, and refuses to advertise on fake news networks. Instead, they're right here with us. Just go to puretalk.com slash Levin, puretalk.com slash L-E-V-I-N, and make the switch right now so you can actually afford that burger and fries. That's puretalk.com slash Levin. L-E-V-I-N. So Dana Bash defends Biden on what RFK said um, and challenges him on the censorship issue because Dana Bash is a liar and a propagandist, a Democrat hack. The Democrat Party Hates America. Folks, if you haven't read this book, can I strongly encourage you to read it? Here's page 143. Now we're fact-checking Dana Bash. It's not hard to do. When Elon Musk purchased Twitter, he hired a few highly respected independent journalists, albeit left-leaning. 
to review an enormous amount of the decision-making materials, including emails among the and between former Twitter executives and managers. What did they find? Among other things, Matt Taibbi, one of the journalists, told Fox News host Maria Bartiromo, one of the best, in January 23, the following. I think the major evolution of the Twitter file so far is that we've discovered an elaborate bureaucracy of what you might call public-private censorship. Basically, companies like Twitter have a system by which they receive tens of thousands of requests for an action on various accounts, typically through the DHS and FBI, but these requests were coming from basically every department in the government. We've seen them from the HHS, from Treasury, from the DOD, even from the CIA, and they will send basically long lists of accounts in Excel spreadsheet files and ask for action on those accounts. And in many cases, Twitter is complying. Taibbi said, we found one incredible email from former FBI general counsel Jim Baker, and it's essentially celebrating that the FBI had paid $3.4 million for quote-unquote processing requests. So in other words, all those requests that were coming through to Twitter, and we all see the email traffic talking about what a burden it was for the company to process all these requests, that's what the money was for, so they're paying Twitter. For them to look at all these requests for content moderation and censorship that were coming from all these different agencies. Yeah, it's right there. Taibbi also testified about the Biden Disinformation Board instituted by the Department of Homeland Security. He said it's terrifying. They've tried a couple of times. The Disinformation Governance Board last year had to be basically paused after three weeks and then they threw it away. But they continued to have something called the MDM subcommittee. Now, they essentially announced that they're no longer going to have that, this misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation subcommittee. But there's another subcommittee that's coming up behind it that I think may essentially inherit the same mantle that the governance board was supposed to have. So we have to be on the lookout for these government efforts. Stick with me. It's all in the book. I'm turning the pages. Uh for these government efforts to centralize the cleansing of quote-unquote disinformation for the media landscape, which I don't think is the government's job. I want you to play cut five again, Mr. Producer. Dana Bash doing a fact check and saying Robert F. Kennedy Jr. was wrong. Go ahead. Now, let's just be very clear. This is an important fact check. Joe Biden wasn't setting out to censor Kennedy's speech or his political critics. His administration was encouraging social media sites to monitor and take down false information about the COVID-19 pandemic. There's no evidence that Biden himself was involved. Right. All the government. This was all government. You heard what the man said. They looked at the records. Dana Bash is not. Taibbi's left center. Always was. Now I think he's probably a little different, but who the hell knows? But he's, he's very honorable in doing this work here, uh, as are the others. And she's a liar. It's just not true. That it's even worse than Robert Kennedy said. It's worse. And again, we have a federal judge, a federal district judge, that found it to be an outrageous abuse of the First Amendment. We had a panel on a circuit court that went almost as far as that circuit judge, and now this is a debate taking place, I guess, in the Supreme Court. But there's simply no question at all that Robert Kennedy is correct. And they weren't just targeting information, misinformation, disinformation. What's with these people? The government says it's A, so Dana Bash says it's A. But if it were Trump in the White House, they'd be all over it. He'd be Hitler 15 times over. Wouldn't that? Yes, he would. Pretty awful. But there you have, the evidence is overwhelming. And by the way, the book goes on and on about this. And you've heard me, it's amazing, on the air, how many times I reference my book, where I did all the research on the Democrat Party Hates America. It is so relevant to what's going on today. But it even got worse for Mr. Taibbi. Um, Taibbi and his fellow journalist Michael Schellenberger studied the materials testified that their findings before a House committee they came under an organized, vicious, withering personal assault on their characters and professionalism by committee Democrats 
who had no interest in their findings, and they clearly planned to attack the journalist's integrity. They implied that Taibbi and Schellenberg were paid off, they were not real journalists, that they cherry-picked data and so forth. You remember all this. It's the Twitter fire scandal. They also revealed the role of public and semi-private organizations coordinating with the government to censor questions or contrary views about COVID vaccines, label such information as disinformation, and Taibbi explained that our most recent discoveries involve something called Stanford's Virility Project, which was created by Stanford. It's an outgrowth of something that was called the Election Integrity Partnership that was founded in 2020. There's a lot of state money involved in this project. But what was most significant about what we found, we found emails to Twitter in which this project told them that they should consider a standard misinformation on their platform, true stories that might promote hesitancy or true stories of vaccine side effects and on and on. But it wasn't just about vaccines, as we know from the cover-up of the Biden laptop. So we know that's the case. So how dare she say what she said? Bullet. Examples. The White House asked Twitter to censor Robert Kennedy Jr., a known critic of the White House's COVID-19 narrative. That's what he's talking about. To censor him. She No, not him, his opinion. No, him. Bullet. The White House directs Facebook to shut down conservative voter- voices Tucker Carlson and Tommy Lahren. Bullet. White House Digital Director Flaherty scolds Facebook, saying that he really couldn't care less about products unless they're having measurable impact at suppressing speech. Bullet. Flaherty informs Facebook that misinformation around the vaccine is a current concern shared at the highest levels. And I mean the highest, he says, in the White House. That would be Biden, Dana Bash, just so you're aware. And it goes on. In regard to... uh, And there's a lot more. Turley. The Global Disinformation Index, GDI, particularly insidious part of the Biden administration's censorship effort, funded in part by $330 million from the U.S. State Department through the National Endowment for Democracy, which contributes to this budget. The GDI was designed to steer advertisers and subscribers away from risky sites, which it says pose reputational and brand risk. So you can see, it's ubiquitous, it's all of government, it's government with the social platforms, It's government now funding entities that determine who is and isn't in the right. Uh, Decisions being made on who should and shouldn't advertise where. GDI warned advertisers that these sites could damage their reputations and brands. They included the New York Post, Reason Magazine, Real Clear Politics, The Daily Wire, The Blaze, One American News Network, The Federalist, Newsmax, The American Spectator, and The American Conservative. And Turley points out the funding of GDI and the FBI censorship efforts are consistent with Biden's pronounced anti-free speech policies since taking office in 2020. So there you go, CNN. The real threat to democracy is in the Oval Office right now. Him, Biden. Trump didn't do anything like this. I'll be right back. Nowadays, 20 bucks barely gets you a burger and fries and maybe a quarter tank of gasoline. You know what it will get you, though? For just $20 a month, you can get unlimited talk, text, and plenty of 5G data from my cell phone company, Pure Talk. You'll get the same quality of service as AT&T, Verizon, or T-Mobile, but for half the cost. The average family saves almost $1,000 a year, all with no contracts and no activation fees. You can trade your phone or get great deals on the latest iPhones and Androids. Make the switch today and save an additional 50% off your first month. Choose a wireless company that shares our values, that supports our military and veterans, that creates American jobs, and refuses to advertise on fake news networks. Instead, they're right here with us. Just go to puretalk.com slash Levin, puretalk.com slash L-E-V-I-N, and make the switch right now so you can actually afford that burger and fries. That's puretalk.com slash Levin. N-L-E-V-I-N. America's most powerful conservative voice, The Mark Levin Show. Dial in now, 877-381-3811. You know, people underestimate you and my audience, you great Levinites and patriots. They underestimate you. They underestimate your intelligence. Of course, I know how smart you are. I wouldn't be talking about the things that I talk about on the air here. And they underestimate your loyalty. 
That is, for us to have the second largest, I would argue pretty close to the first, but the second largest syndicated radio show in America at this time of the day means for many of you this is appointment radio and people just don't understand appointment radio. So I'm of the view that regardless of any platform, Mr. Producer, the audience and I are interconnected, tied in a way that nothing can ever come between us. Don't you agree? 100%. And so, trust me when I tell you I know I'm blessed by you. And that's why I'm always committed to you. No, it's a funny thing. <clears throat> I have a wonderful Chabad rabbi. And people say, are you reform? You can, I'm definitely not reform. That to me is the bastardization of the Jewish faith. But that's just me. That's how I was raised. Not by my parents, but in a reform synagogue. I'm certainly beyond that. Going through the motions. On the other hand, I don't go through all the motions when it comes to Orthodox Judaism. Although I've been embracing it more and more, it doesn't, it's not really what I do. But I respect those who do because they're very committed. So I once said to my rabbi, Chaim Cohen, I believe in God and I pray to God, but I don't always go through the bureaucracy. You understand what I mean, Rich? You're Catholic, you know what I mean, right? Yes. So, I don't believe in burning everything down around me, that everybody has to follow me. That is ridiculous. I reject that. And there's something very comforting in knowing that there are people who do follow, religiously, if you will, their faiths. There are. But I'm mentioning this for the same reason. Companies are companies. Broadcast companies are broadcast companies. Some are better than others. We deal with many wonderful, wonderful broadcast companies. In fact, well over half of my listenership comes from broadcast platforms that aren't even owned by Cumulus Westwood One. I'd say close to 60% or so. That's because of the wonderful relationship we have with some of these other broadcast companies and with their audiences. Plus, who the hell is going to do what I do three hours a day as well as I do it? No brag, just fact. Nobody. But you're loyal. When we go on podcast, you go to the podcast. When we go online through streaming, you go online to streaming. When we do satellite, you go to satellite. And of course, our wonderful terrestrial affiliates. And this is a fantastic thing. And we have overlap with Blaze TV and overlap with the Fox show and overlap with Simon & Schuster and the books that I write. These things don't just happen. Just so you know. People ask me all the time. That's why I'm discussing this. So, to do a three-hour radio show, you can open your mic, Mr. Producer. I spend almost every waking hour, almost every sleeping hour, which is like three or four tops, digging and doing research for this show. Mr. Producer, you get emails what time of the day and night? Midnight, two, three, four, five in the morning. That's correct. I'm an insomniac. I'm when reading. do you sleep? I'm staying. When do I sleep? Not often. Not often. Sometimes it puts me in a grouchy mood, but not often. And there's always, so the mind is always processing different things and different things that I want to share with you on different formats that I want to share with you and so forth. And I think you get the sense of that over time. You get the sense of that. So, To me, it's not the platform that's so important. It's the content that's important. And of course, we appreciate all the platforms we have. But that's not why I exist. To work for platforms, to work for companies, to work for an executive, to work for this, to work for... I do what I do with you, for you. All the rest of it is... 
the bureaucracy in between. The bureaucracy in between. Some of it is worth embracing, some of it is not. And that bureaucracy in between is always changing, by the way. People moving into podcasts. There must be thousands of podcasters now, aren't there, Mr. There have to be thousands of them. More than thousands? Tens of thousands? And I've often wondered... By the way, don't read anything into this. I'm talking off the top of my head. I've often wondered if I only did a podcast, would we be one of the biggest in the country, if not the world? What would your guess be, Mr. Produce? If not close to it. I would say that to the audience, too. If there's only one place you could go to hear me, would you go to that place? I think you would. In fact, I know you would. But this is why we appreciate all of our affiliates here. 350 affiliates. Now, I work with Cumulus Westwood One. In the top markets, I think I'm on five or six of their stations. But you can't have a syndication on five or six top stations. You need the support of other companies. iHeart, Salem, Entercom. Uh Uh-oh, I started down the list. Probably 25 different broadcast companies, from massive, like iHeart, to the smallest of the small, where somebody owns a station or a handful of stations. All demographics, all parts of the country, all. And there's only one reason that these people are as kind as they are and as generous as they are, because they know you want to hear me. Or you may want to call in from time to time. Those are smart broadcasters. Those are smart companies. That is, broadcast companies that aren't trying to fight the audience and force information down the audience's throat, but are trying to embrace the audience and follow the audience. These successful broadcast companies, stations, and other platforms understand this. Don't fight your audience. Embrace your audience. Respect your audience. I'm only talking about this now because people are talking with me. I think about these things a little bit more. A little bit more. The older you get, the more you've been in this business. You start to think about it because you see these things swirling around and so forth. Rush, who's my radio mentor, Rush. I met Rush, I can't give you the date, long time ago. I started to send in my thoughts and my views on the law and on the Constitution when he would bump into these issues. And somehow it got to him. And then his assistant, you might remember Kathy Gleason, he called her Cookie. And back then, I didn't email very much. That's how long ago it was. Rush was getting into email and technology. He was a technology whiz. He loved technology. Me, I can't stand it. So I would fax <laughs> my points, my arguments to him. Not, not, I'm not talking about to read from, but to give him information. And he would often use it, and he would often give me credit for it. And it became a routine process where I thought about things and I would send it to them where he then announced that I was the director of his legal division and called me F. Lee Levin he just did it on the air one day and that's how that got started and he taught me so much about this business the truth is he didn't like management he said all through my career Mark management was telling me how to do my job And they were wrong. They fired me seven times. And they were wrong. He said, follow your North Star. Do what you know to be right. Never take the audience for granted. Treat them with respect. Don't allow commercials on your program 
that are degrading to yourself and your audience. That's why I won't do any erectile dysfunction commercials. If they are, they're local. They're not from me. He said, after all, we're not only on a mission, it's a business, and the business has to have a brand. And the brand can't be anything goes for a buck. It just can't be. And the people at iHeart used to call themselves Premier. They understood that. They had a hell of a sales force. They understood Rush. They understood what he could, would, and wouldn't do. They were all in. And he invited me down from time to time to watch him do his show. I remember he did a show years ago. He was doing a show from his home in Palm Beach. Somebody ratted him out, and then they had to get a townhouse in West Palm Beach to do it from and all that. It was outrageous what they did. <clears throat> it's not like he's, you know, it's not physical labor behind a microphone. And he once said to me when I first got into radio, he said, you were studying me there, weren't you, when I would have you at the house? And I said, yes, sir. You were watching how I do things, weren't you? I said, yes, I was. And yet we have different personalities, but the same philosophy. My mentor. And dear, dear close friend who's deeply missed today. But he always said about the bureaucracy and broadcasting, you can have friends and so forth and so on, but in the end, in the end, they're basically for themselves. Stay close to your audience. Because without your audience, you're nothing. Don't cut corners by having a thousand guests. Don't fall for the momentary buck with ads where you disrespect yourself because then you disrespect your audience. Even one said to me, class works. In other words, being classy works. You don't have to be stupid. You don't have to be a fool. Be yourself. You know, I wrote Liberty and Tyranny. And my dad, first one, who said, that's going to sell a million copies. And then Rush said, he read it. He said, I've never read anything like this. In all the years I've read books, this is years and years ago. What's it, 15 or so? And he was always very excited when I wrote these books. You might recall when my book Rescuing Sprite came out. And he said, I want you to come down here, Mark, to the studio in Florida. I want to do a face-to-face, one-hour interview with you. I said, on rescuing Sprite Rush? He said, yes. He said, you know why? I said, why? Because people want to know the human side of Rush Limbaugh, and they want to know the human side of Mark Levin, and we do have a human side. You've written it in this book, and I want to talk about it. His class, his hard work philosophy. This guy got up early and went to bed late working on that show and he was enormously well. He didn't have to do it, but it was him. He wanted to do it for you. And I learned all this from him and I will never forget it. In other words, circling back, my point is that I do this show because we have a special relationship. I don't do it for any platform, whether it's podcast or radio. or I do it Because I believe in what we do. And by the way, that's the other great thing about this format, talk radio, wherever it exists. What's that? I can talk to you the way I just did for the last five minutes. Where else can you do that? I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. (laughs) 
Nowadays, 20 bucks barely gets you a burger and fries or maybe a quarter tank of gasoline. You know what it will get you, though? For just $20 a month, you can get unlimited talk, text, and plenty of 5G data from my cell phone company, Pure Talk. You'll get the same quality of service as AT&T, Verizon, or T-Mobile, but for half the cost. The average family saves almost $1,000 a year, all with no contracts and no activation fees. You can trade your phone or get great deals on the latest iPhones and Androids. Make the switch today and save an additional 50% off your first month. Choose a wireless company that shares our values, that supports our military and veterans, that creates American jobs, and refuses to advertise on fake news networks. Instead, they're right here with us. Just go to puretalk.com slash Levin, puretalk.com slash L-E-V-I-N, and make the switch right now so you can actually afford that burger and fries. That's puretalk.com slash Levin. N L E V I N. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, you're not going to see any headlines to this effect. CNN is desperately trying to defeat me on Saturday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern. They basically gave up on Sunday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern, so they tried a trick. Although they don't view it as a trick. They took Bill Maher, uh, and they take some of his more, I guess, popular shows and they they run them uh, as a program at 8 p.m. Eastern on CNN. They've run it two Saturdays in a row and just to tell you, I've crushed Bill Maher I think this Saturday by over half a million viewers and in the demo. Now you ask yourselves, why isn't that in any newspaper? You know damn well if he was beating me it would be. Look, we take them as they come here, whether it's on radio or TV or whatever. We do our thing, and you follow, and I follow you. The Power Hour is next. I shall return. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting them from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, America. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. Somebody woke up Joe Biden typed up a statement for him, which he's putting out. I want you to listen to this. Statement from President Joe Biden on the death of World Central Kitchen workers in Gaza. They're exploiting the death of these, the accidental tragic death of these workers. Joe Biden doesn't give a damn. He doesn't give a damn about the people dying on the southern border. He doesn't give a damn about the American hostages among those that Hamas has taken. Never says a word about them. Never meets with the families that have been devastated by the toxic drugs coming over the border and their kids dying. Never talks about the Americans left in Afghanistan. They don't even know how many are left. I am outraged and heartbroken, he says, by the deaths of seven humanitarian workers from World Central Kitchen, including one American in Gaza yesterday. They were providing food to hungry civilians in the middle of a war. They were brave and selfless. Their deaths are a tragedy. Israel has pledged to conduct a thorough investigation into why the aid workers' vehicles were hit by airstrikes. That investigation must be swift, it must bring accountability, and the findings must be made public. So they're all singing from the same sheet, uh, sheet of music. Even more tragically, ready? This is not a standalone incident. This conflict has been one of the worst in recent memory in terms of how many aid workers have been killed. By whom? This is a major reason why distributing humanitarian aid in Gaza has been so difficult because Israel has not done enough to protect aid workers trying to deliver desperately needed help to civilians. You believe this, Mr. Producer? All these terrorists roaming around, thousands of them, and it's Israel's fault? Incidents like yesterday simply should not happen. Israel has also not done enough to protect civilians. The United States has repeatedly urged Israel to de-conflict their military operations against Hamas with humanitarian operations in order to avoid civilian casualties. In other words, they want Israel to stop and not defeat Hamas, which would be a suicidal move. 
The United States will continue to do all we can to deliver humanitarian assistance to Palestinian civilians in Gaza through all available means. I will continue to press Israel to do more to facilitate that aid. We're pushing hard for an immediate ceasefire as part of a hostage deal. No, they didn't. The resolution in the U.N. decoupled the release of hostages from a ceasefire. He's a liar. I have a team in Cairo working on this right now. Earlier today, I spoke with my friend Chef Jose Andres the founder of the World Central Kitchen, to convey my deepest condolences for the deaths of these courageous work, aid workers and to express my continued support for his and his team's relentless and heroic efforts to get food to hungry people around the world. May God bless the humanitarian workers killed yesterday and comfort their families and loved ones in their grief. This is a sleazy, sleazy statement. He could have said that what took place was a terrible, terrible accident. The Israelis are looking into it, and we look forward to the report. No, 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 no. Again, I want to remind you, I guess I'll have to do this on Fox, too. I want to remind you that there was a drone strike by the Biden administration where they said they were taking out a terrorist. They called it a righteous strike. They claimed no civilians. But later it was learned that it was not a righteous strike, that in fact we struck one of the leading individuals involved in providing aid aid to the Afghans, despite the dangers with the Taliban, and killed him, nine members of his family, including seven who were children. Now, I don't blame the United States military for this. It's war. It's difficult. It's not intentional. And yet Biden turns around and he's attacking Israel. So why isn't anybody bringing this up? Why isn't anybody bringing it up tonight? Because Biden will keep doing this. Biden is at war with Israel, and he's at war with the American people. Flying in hundreds of thousands of illegal aliens. He doesn't care about the slavery that's going on on the border. He doesn't care about the children who are sold on the, on the border. He doesn't care about the, the uh, indentured servitude of so many of the people trying to pay off the cartels and their coyotes as they're brought into the country. He doesn't care. He doesn't care at all that terrorists are sneaking through. There's no question about it. Everybody's telling him, be aware there's terrorists coming. He doesn't care. Now, if you're the Israelis and something like this happens, you go, oh, my God, this is a horrible thing. Let's invest it. Now you know that the American government, the Biden regime, is going to try and use it to destroy you. And yet we have this strike They killed a top aid worker in Afghanistan and his entire family, including seven children. I don't believe the Israelis held a press conference on that one, did they, Mr. Producer? I don't believe they called the families, and the family that is. Well, there wasn't any left, I guess. And Biden, when he does this, he's spreading the Jew hatred. He is confirming for the river to the sea crowd in the United States that they should keep the pressure on and get even more violent and threatening? What happens if Biden's reelected, by the way? To us, it's a disaster. What happens to the state of Israel? I will tell you now, I don't know if it's going to continue to exist. I just don't know. Because this hate, this campaign by the Democrat Party since Israel was attacked on October 7th. You see, Israel's not allowed to win. Perfectly fine when they keep giving land away, the Oslo Accords, and to pretend that the PLO is peaceful when it's clearly not. When I said Joe Biden's an anti-Semite, I wasn't kidding. When I said Blinken is a traitor, I wasn't kidding. I mean, I'm holding two articles, uh, two pieces of paper in front of me. One is the Biden statement, that comes on top of the Kirby statement, that comes on top of the Blinken statement. And I'm holding the news article about the U.S. drone strike that killed a top aid worker and his entire family, including seven children. So everybody knows that these things are horrible, but they happen during war. Things are moving fast at great distances. He wants a report, and he wants it right now. What does he want? Wants an, a, a pound of flesh, an ounce of blood. What does he want? Biden is using this for propaganda. 
Biden funded this war. Biden funded October 7th with the aid that he allowed to flow into Iran and the rest of the regimes. Great article from the tablet was written about this. I've posted it and I've read from it for you. Iran was behind October 7th, and the Biden administration paid for it. That's the title, as I recall. He takes no responsibility for any of this. None. None. So I dare the media out there, dare it, to remind their viewers and their listeners of the Biden Blinken drone that killed 10 innocent people, including seven children, including a top aid worker in Afghanistan. I assume he was a hero and courageous too, no joke, right? Right, Biden? But they weren't wringing their hands about it, you know. First they said it was a righteous strike. Then, yeah, it was apologized a hundred times. Obviously, he wasn't personally involved. These things happen during war, as terrible as it is. It's not the first time, won't be the last time. And in fact, in wars, it happens multiple times. Multiple times. You even have individuals who are killed by their own side by accident in war. It's a terrible thing, and it does happen. It happened to another family of one. Gold Star family, fantastic people who I admire, uh, who we've talked about in the past, but I don't necessarily want to bring that up and upset them. But you understand the point. So Biden makes his comment. It's almost self-righteous. Trashing Israel for an error that was made, a mistake, in the middle of a conflict. And then he goes on to say they're not doing enough for the civilians. They're not providing enough aid. I've told them to to ramp down the military activity, and so they're trying to destroy Hamas. There's not a government in Israel that would survive if it didn't support that position. Not one. Because the Israeli people have had enough after 75 years of this crap. They've had enough. And Joe Biden's been on the wrong side every damn time, whether it's Menachem Begin or early on Golda Meir. He's been on the wrong side every damn time, as he has been in the United States the hell is he doing allowing tens of billions of dollars to flow to iran telling foreign nations to fund unrwa so he can pretend that he's not hundreds of millions to the plo which is not moderate it's a terrorist regime founded by arafat hezbollah firing rockets down on israel how come he doesn't release a statement about haiti and all the gang activity that's taking place there how come he doesn't do that that's in our hemisphere 11 million people starving Starving, not a word, you see, because they care about civilians. They don't care about Palestinians and Gazans and Arabs or whatever the name is. They don't care. They hate the state of Israel. And they hate the fact that Netanyahu stands up to them. He doesn't bow to them. That's what they hate. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. It's a pleasure and honor to have with us Carolyn Glick, who is a a senior contributing editor at JNS, host of the Carolyn Glick Show podcast, brilliant writer, dear, dear friend. How are you? I'm great. Great to be on your show, Mark. Well, Carolyn, we have uh, Joe Biden putting out a statement, Blinken, Kirby, trashing Israel uh, for this, you know, accident in which... uh, Seven food aid workers were killed. Uh, And then expanding it, we've been telling Israel they need to do more to feed the people in Gaza. We've told Israel to be more careful. We've told Israel to wind down its military operation. I mean, it's going on and on and on. Is this the way an ally is supposed to conduct itself to exploit a situation like this? Um, You know, we've never really experienced anything like this from the United States before. Israel has always defended itself by itself. We've never asked the United States to send forces to defend us or any bases or anything like that. You know, we always just defend ourselves by ourselves. The one thing that we always were able to uh, count on during war is that uh, the United States of America sided with us. And what's most disturbing about what we're seeing from the Biden administration, particularly in recent weeks, um, is that all of their positions are actually in line with uh, our enemies' uh, war aims. 
you know, whether it's Hamas wanting to survive in order to restore its power in Gaza and rebuild, uh, and the United States saying you can't take out the remaining battalions that they have in their military forces, and you have to stand down and you have to let their allies, the Palestinian Authority security forces that the United States trains, but then they use the U.S. training to kill kill Israelis in terrorist attacks. Um, you know, it, whatever it is, the, the Americans seem to just be aligned with Hamas's war strategy, which is to use civilians as human shields and then wait and attrit Israel until international opinion turns against it, led by the United States. And that's exactly what the Biden administration is doing. So this is something we've actually never had before. We've always, you know, America's always had our back in the international arena, at, at least uh, uh, to, to a significant degree, maybe not 100 percent, but, you know, more than 50. And here what we're seeing is a complete shift where the United States uses every opportunity as an opportunity to every everything that happens there as an opportunity to try to undermine Israel's war effort and our goals. And this is pretty precious, what the Biden administration is doing today. Uh, the statement put out by the president, secretary of state goes to the microphone. Given that uh, a couple of years back, we had a drone strike that hit what we were told was a righteous strike because it hit a terrorist and a terrorist nest when in fact it hit a a major aid worker in Afghanistan, killed his entire family, nine other members, including seven children. Has anybody brought that up? No, it's not just that. You know, I mean, all of these things are tragedies. People operating in war zones, whether they're reporters or aid workers, doctors, whatever they happen to be, you know, they place themselves in harm's way because they believe in what they're doing. Now, I, I was an embedded reporter with the 3rd Infantry Division during the war in Iraq. And, uh, you know, there were a lot of uh, reporters there that were wounded. I had a friend, Michael Kelly, from The Washington Post, who was killed. Um, but nobody came to the United States and said, you're evil because Michael Kelly was killed on the road up to Baghdad. You know, people put themselves in war zones, in battle zones, and they incur a certain amount of risk. And it's a terrible tragedy when when people who aren't involved, people who are trying to do good, are killed. But it's just, you know, it's not because of a malign intent, either on the part of the United States or Israel. And what's really troubling here is that obviously the Israeli military you know, is taking incredible means, steps to avoid civilian casualties. We have the lowest civilian to combatant ratio among Gazans in the history of warfare, not just according to, you know, the prime minister of Israel, but according to the head of the urban warfare department at West Point, and according to David Petraeus, General David Petraeus, the former director of the CIA and commander of U.S. forces in Iraq, you know, these are people who, who have a dog in the fight in the sense that they care about truth, and this is what they're saying. So, you know, I don't understand how it is that every civilian casualty, particularly when you know that Hamas's war fighting strategy is to increase, to maximize the number of Gazans who are killed so that people will blame Israel for their deaths, that that's actually working, that the Americans are saying, oh, yeah, yeah, all of these people... Israel's responsible for killing them when it's simply the exact opposite, and uh, it's very troubling. Don't you believe, as an outsider observing what's going on in our country here, that when uh, Biden and Blinken and uh, Kirby speak this way, they also fire up the anti-Semites and the jew haters in our country? They, they give them cover, like Schumer did when he gave his speech on the Senate floor. You know, it's very strange. It's true, because on the one hand, the White House has committed itself to fighting anti-Semitism. But on the other hand, they're feeding these blood libels against Israel. For instance, USA, USAID Administrator Samantha Power, she's put out statements accusing Israel of deliberately causing starvation in northern Gaza when nothing could be further from the truth. But you put out these claims that are totally false. And then go figure out how Israel is supposed to defend itself against these malign slanders, because if, if people don't die of starvation, it's because Samantha Power and all of her friends prevented it from happening. But they were never in danger of being starved anyway. The only people who are starving to death deliberately are, are, the, are the hostages, are the 134 Israeli hostages that are being held by Hamas, and Hamas has been deliberately starving them to death. <laughs> 
and denying them food. And you, you never hear an outcry about that. Those are the truly innocent civilians and victims here, the people who were taken from Israel on October 7th and almost six months later are still hostages to this monstrous group of murderers. And yet all of the outcry is against Israel, who's, which is doing everything to minimize civilian casualties, is not starving anybody. There's more food coming into Gaza today than was coming into Gaza before October 7th. So, you know, it's a very, very strange set of circumstances. But when Samantha Power and others, including James Kirby and Jake Sullivan and Tony Blinken and the president himself, make these accusations that are untrue, or uh, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, all of them using Hamas's false propaganda in terms of civilian casualties, are simply untrue. We're going to carry over the bottom of the hour. We have a hard break. Carolyn Glick, senior contributing editor at JNS, host of the Carolyn Glick Show. Wonderful podcast. We'll be right back. Mark Levin, the thunder on the right. Call in now, 877-381-3811. We're here with Carolyn Glick, senior contributing editor, JNS, host of the Carolyn Glick Show. By the way, if people want to hear your podcast, exactly how do they go about doing that? Where do they go? Oh, they can go to uh, YouTube and go to the Carolyn Glick Show or JNS TV, get the Carolyn Glick Show. I'm on Rumble. They can get the Carolyn Glick Show. You can get it. And also all major uh, podcast um, outlets you can go to and get the Carolyn Glick Show. And it's very much worth it. Very much worth it. You're ubiquitous. That's a good thing. Um, (laughs) I try to be. (laughs) So... uh, What do you think, I mean, other than the politics, it has to be deeper than that. Joe Biden, his Obama team that surrounds him, they're not just critical of Israel. They have now turned anti-Israel and are undermining Israel and are threatening to withhold arms from Israel, conducting war crimes investigations against Israel, on and on and on. Do you think these people have been in a closet and they've just come out because they are now revealing who they are? Yeah, I just wanted to, I think when you were asking me about the anti-Semitism issue, I think here it really plays into it, because when you hear people like Samantha Power making these false allegations against Israel that were deliberately starving people, God forbid, in Gaza, but just projecting Hamas's crimes onto Israel, or every major official in the Biden administration using Hamas's fake numbers of casualties to claim that we're deliberately killing civilians when the ratios have never been lower of civilians to combatant death in the history of warfare than they are in Gaza uh, with the with the Israel Defense Forces operations there. What they're doing is they're giving fuel to these anti-Semites on the streets of the United States of America who are attacking Jews uh, on college campuses, at synagogues, on the streets of the major cities of the United States, accusing them of genocide, accusing them of supporting genocide, accusing them of uh, starving people, so that when you get this kind of echo chamber where it's going from Hamas propaganda to the Department of Defense and the Defense Secretary uh, and uh, USAID from the EU, making these allegations that are simply lies against Israel, then that gives fuel to the people on the street who are attacking Jewish Americans. And it's a, it's a noxious mix, and it's, and it's obviously antithetical to the idea that Jews have equal rights and civil rights in this country because uh, they're being attacked and they're being discriminated against and they're being harassed. Yesterday you had an event at, in Teaneck, New Jersey, where they were honoring Israeli first responders. And these pro-Hamas protesters came out to try to intimidate people away from going to the synagogue there. What is that? And they were given a permit, even though it was clear that this was a hateful demonstration against Jews and a way to constrain their civil rights that just having events at their synagogues. So, you know, th- these are the kinds of things that are, are, are create a toxic mix, both in terms of Israel-American relations, but also in terms of the, the treatment of Jewish Americans, and, and it's very troubling. Biden, in his statement today, even more tragically than 
the seven who died. This is not a standalone incident. He and Blinken and Kirby saying exactly the same. This conflict has been one of the worst in recent memory in terms of how many aid workers have been killed. This is a major reason why distributing humanitarian aid in Gaza has been so difficult because Israel has not done enough to protect aid workers trying to deliver desperately needed help to civilians. These are blasphemous lies. These kinds of statements are outrageous. No mention of what Hamas steals and then resells and Egypt's role in blocking aid. There's not a thing in here that's accurate. No, and again, you know, this feeds into this noxious kind of discourse about Israel, about Jewish people that is going around throughout the Western world, including in the United States. And uh, it's very troubling because these are simply untruths. It's just not true. Israel is going further than any country, including the United States and Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, to protect civilians, both Palestinian and foreign operating in Gaza. We are taking more actions, more steps to protect uh, non-combatants in Gaza than the United States took. And the United States went through great lengths to protect civilians as well in Iraq and Afghanistan and in other battlefields. And yet Israel does even more. And rather than applauding Israel for what we've been doing, we're seeing the Biden administration casting out against Israel as if we're a criminal state and not the, the most powerful and loyal American ally in the Middle East. You talk to a lot of people in Israel, obviously. You come across many of them. How are they reacting to this? Is this demoralizing? It, it, it's, it's very alarming because uh, um, Israelis have long trusted in 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 its ally in their alliance with the United States, you know you have you have military leaders in Israel who have for generations, not for generations, for the past generation, insisted that Israel's most important uh, strategic advantage is our alliance with the United States. That that's the most important thing. That it's our alliance with the United States that's the most important thing. And um, and and Israeli the Israeli people trusted in that. And what we're finding now is that the polls are showing that the vast majority of Americans support Israel against Hamas. Just had a new Harvard-Harris poll come out last week that said that, you know, 80 percent or 79 percent of Americans support Israel in this war. Two-thirds to 75 percent support all of Israel's war aims and think that Israel is prosecuting the war correctly. Um, And yet you get the exact opposite position coming from the administration. I think that Israelis are trying to see how you square this circle where uh, the American people uh, are, when polled, show extraordinary support for Israel. And yet that's not being that's not being reflected in the positions that we're getting from the administration. So it's very it's very distressing. But it, on the one hand, it's, it's heartening to know that the American people stand with us, as we see in these polls. But it's disturbing and really scary in a way to see the way that the Biden administration is just, like you said, you know, they're, they're, they're slandering us. What's amazing is six months, pretty much, almost to the day, six months after October 7th, didn't take six months, but here we are six months later, and Israel really is fighting a multi-front war, and that includes with the propaganda and the policies coming out of the Biden administration. I mean, you're getting stabbed in the back, and you're facing down the enemy that surrounds you, and it's got to be a very precarious situation. Well, it is, because, I mean, you know, we we just had yesterday, we had... Uh, Qasem Soleimani's uh, replacement, this guy named Reza Zahedi, uh, who is in charge of all of the Iranian terror operations in Lebanon and in, among the Palestinians and in other areas. So he's really directing the war against us. And he was assassinated together with 10 other people who were working with him in this uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps office in Damascus. And they're attributing it to Israel. Um, and so, you know, they're all threatening Iran. Uh, the supreme dictator of Iran threatened to shoot missiles and blow up the Israeli foreign ministry. And you have war music being broadcast on Lebanese radio by Hezbollah, which is controlled by Iran and which controls Lebanon. And you have the Houthis in Yemen and you have uh, you have Iraqi 
militias that are controlled by Iran threatening to invade Jordan and send an army across the Jordan River into Israel to invade. And, you know, you have all of these fronts. And rather than seeing, even just rhetorically, a strong U.S. support for Israel against all of this, you're seeing the opposite. You're seeing that the United States wants to give a state as quickly as possible to the Palestinians who who started this whole thing when they invaded Israel with a division-level force of 3,000 uh, in trained and organized units, and they carried out a one-day Holocaust against Israeli civilians and military and you know, killed 1,200 people in the most sadistic, barbarous way and uh, and stole 236 hostages to Gaza. I mean, these are 246 uh it's stunning. Hmm. Yeah, what's taking place here, I'll tell you, is unbelievable. But I hope the Israeli people do understand that there is pushback here. Uh, it is very concerning. But our colleges and universities, our uh, entertainment industry, the Democrat Party, <coughs> excuse me, and the media, those four legs of the stool are really anti-Israel and anti-Israel in a big way. It's just that everybody between the East and West Coast, with some exceptions, support Israel. But we don't have a lot of say, the people in between the East Coast and West Coast, apparently, on what goes on in our government. November is going to be very, very important, not only for our own country, but I think the survivability of Israel. It's a crucial, crucial time. And uh, any final words? Well, you know, I think one of the things that's most heartening is that what people are beginning to realize in Israel over the past six months is that the generals had it exactly backwards, that the greatest guarantor of Israel's survival is the Israeli people. And when you look at the war that our army has been fighting, it's it's simply uh, amazing. I mean, mm -hmm. first of all, uh, our soldiers are incredibly courageous. You know, they're just running into fire to to defend the country and to defeat our enemies without hesitation. Their, their courage is tremendous, and the ingenuity of the IDF in figuring out, I mean, you know, in the midst of the war, they, we had this reservist who figured out how to develop drones that were going to be capable of fighting in tunnels, something that nobody ever thought you could do. There are 400 miles of tunnels underground in Gaza, and lo and behold, Presto, within a couple of weeks of the ground operation, Israel figured out how to fight there. Nobody had ever fought in a tunnel war before. So, you know, I think, you know, we're facing a really difficult war in Israel, uh, one we've never seen before. We've never had a war that's lasted so long. Six months is way longer than our longest war, except for a war of independence. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a stunning thing. Uh, but, uh, uh, what we're doing is every every victory that Israel achieves on the ground also redounds to the national security of the United States, because whether the Biden administration wants to acknowledge it or not, the Iranians and their entire terror access uh, views the United States as their greatest enemy. And they can't be appeased out of that belief system. And so, you know, by, by defeating Hamas, in Gaza completely. Israel's going to cast a, a massive blow at this whole Iranian system of terror. And any other action that America, that, that Israel takes, again, is just going to protect the United States. So it's one of those things where, you know, the, the, any particular U.S. administration at any particular day may or may not like uh, Israel or may, not, may or may not like the government of Israel, but the fact is that we're on the same side. And when the United States achieves victory in its wars, Israelis applaud and cheer because they know that it redounds to our national security. And the same is true in the case right. of Israel. And our achievements make America safer as well. You're right. But the problem here is even worse than Neville Chamberlain, we're actually funding the enemy. Neville Chamberlain didn't fund the enemy. Carolyn Glick, I want to thank you so much for all you do. Senior contributing editor at JNS, host of the Carolyn Glick Show, most importantly, a friend of the family. God bless you, my friend, and keep it up. 
God bless you, Mark, and thank you, and thank all of your, re- your, your viewers and your listeners for supporting Israel as well. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. We'll be right back. Mark Lovin. The uh, subway in New York has uh, tracks that expand about 665 miles. The tunnels in Gaza, tunnels, are over 400 miles. How were those built without the United States knowing about it? That's a lot of dirt to move, isn't it, Mr. Producer? How was it built without the peaceful Palestinians knowing about it? Without the help of the peaceful Palestinians, it goes under schools, it goes under housing projects, it goes under mosques, it goes under hospitals. You can't build that without everybody knowing about it. And how come I'm the only one who asks this question? Well, I guess that's why I'm here. Mitch McConnell has announced that he's going to run again for office. I mean, he's only 82 because he wants to protect the Republican Party from the Republican Party. Go figure that out. Biden's campaign communications director says if violent crime is not skyrocketing. No, not at all. These people are sick. We salute our armed forces, police officers, firefighters, emergency personnel, our truckers. We've got your back. Freedom fighters all over the world in Ukraine and in Israel. We do have your back regardless of the Jew-hating administration that's in power and their party. God bless each of you. See you tomorrow. 